as I say, King put the bishop on d2. Some really unusual formations might have resulted after the equally plausible bishop f4 move. For example, g6, as projected, intending fianchetto. Mike might try now g4, intending to meet knight back to d4 with bishop e5, forcing win of a pawn. And then the extraordinary possibility of bishop to h6 is on, since bishop e5 can be met with bishop to g7. And if bishop captures on h6, black takes back with, of course, the queen knight, which is some of the strangest positions from the opening you ever saw. But there are no strategical defects in Black's game, and he can obviously hope to unravel with f6 or f5, knight to f7, etc. White could, if he wished, just drop back to g3. Offering us the possibility of a unique pawn structure after knight takes g3, h takes g3, bishop to g7. with another position I find very hard to assess, certainly rich in possibilities for both sides. King in fact played eight bishop d2, intending to challenge with this bishop on the key a1 to h8 diagonal. I played the consistent fianchetto, g6, and he challenged with bishop c3. Bishop g7, which he took, and after my recapture, I faced quite an unusual situation. It's not often in Grandmaster Chess, in fact it's almost certainly a unique instance, that after ten moves the only developed piece is the Black Queen Knight on G7. Nevertheless, I think you'll agree the play's been quite logical up until now, and Black still has eyes on that key D4 square, for example, hopping in via the route H6 to F5. In this particular instance, the White Bishop doesn't have all that much scope. So here, 5, knight to c6, the novelty, worked quite well on its only outing so far at grandmaster level. It's quite a logical move. The whole focus is on the square d4, the logical follow-up to the capture on f3 being to play c5 and knight c6. The only snag is that white gains some space, but that doesn't seem to be too much of a problem from black's point of view. Well, in a later round of the very same tournament, we were to see a development of this idea of mine of capturing on f3 after white has played g3, and then black playing c5, and meeting white's advance of d4 with knight to c6. This time I was playing Nigel Davis, but in the particular setting we're going to look at now, I didn't get the timing quite right and was lucky to escape with a draw. However, the game is, I think, valuable because it throws light upon the structure of the opening as a whole, and I think clear improvements for black can be cited, which are of importance. So it went two knights c3, e6, three knight f3, bishop b7, now the fianchetto, g3, and we'll note in passing black can play c5, or d5, or knight f6, reaching recognized openings. Could also play bishop b4. Not quite as orthodox, but looks completely okay to me. But, as I said, we took on f3. White took back, and the c5 advance hoping to clamp on d4. So d4 has to be played immediately if you're going to play it with white. And Nigel did. But here, certainly correct for black is to take on d4, reaching that slightly inferior middle game we referred to earlier. Since that is his best move, it seems that c5 probably wasn't right here. And we'll look at an improvement later on. As I said, I tried knight c6 as I had done versus King in an analogous position, and Davis, of course, advanced the correct move. In we go to d4, and he challenged once again with bishop e3. Well, here by analogy, I could have played e5, but I'd be a tempo down this time, and I suspect that some sort of line opening device like f4 will prize open the position to a degree at least in white's favor. However, that's certainly the best chance, I think, is to play e5. I played knight f5. And Davis very adroitly spotted his chance to get a development lead when bishop h3. And here too, probably black's best is to play not the consistent move 
knight to h6 as I played, trying to keep the clamp on d4 open, but to vary from that and take on e3 and be slightly worse. However, I tried to hang on to d4 and played knight from g8 to h6. Comes a very good move from Davis. Queen a4. g6. White castled. Now I become aware of the pressure on my position if I played bishop g7, staring down the d-file. So I tried to bail out by knight takes e3. f takes e3. Now the pawn on e6 is actually on prees. e takes d5. But white played very dynamically indeed, rook a d1. Obviously that pawn on d5 can't move. Bishop g7, rook takes d5, f5, white doubled, and the only hope was to give up this pawn with castles. White chose to go into the end game. Black is clearly not without some hope of salvation here. Did some further damage to the pawn structure by capturing on c3 and developing his last piece with rook to e8. Davis protected the pawn with king f2. Tactical trick, knight g4 check. Follow if he takes with the pawn, I recapture with the pawn with check, which is quite helpful for me. He took with the bishop. I took back. He advanced f4. Well, Black did actually succeed in pulling off a draw from this position, but he was rather fortunate to do so. Davis should have capped his imaginative play with a little more accurate endgame technique. What this shows, I think, is that the idea of c5 and knight c6 doesn't quite work with one tempo less. Well, I think better than c5 is for Black to advance with 5d5 and try to make something of his superiority in pawn structure. So if white plays the plausible d4, black should now, I think, play c6. And try, if he's lucky, to get in a quick bishop b4 and take off that knight on c3. This, I think, is a better way of proceeding and quite a viable one. Before leaving it, though, I'd like to mention to you one of the most extraordinary games in chess literature, which was played in 1979, between Grandmaster Bilek and Grandmaster now, International Master then, Schüssler, from Sweden. After d5, d4, he took on c4, did Mr. Harry Schüssler. White recaptured with his bishop, and black played against c6, hoping, as with the move order I recommend, to exploit the isolated d4 pawn. But he's in for a rude awakening because white just advanced d5. Black took with the e pawn, and white took back with a knight. The problem being that if black takes again, white takes back with the queen, and black will suffer material loss on a8. Well, what happened now is really extraordinary. Schuster played knight to e7, and Bilek, with a flourish, played knight to f6 check, and looked around triumphantly at the crowd of people watching the board. Very clever idea, winning the black queen. Schuster immediately recaptured having thought for quite a while over his previous move, and offered a draw. Oh, of course not, said Susan, said Bilek, and captured on f7 with check, winning the black queen. But appearances can be deceptive. Sure enough, the black queen vanishes from the board, but it became apparent to Mr. Bilek, after knight d5, that his queen wasn't going anywhere. It's behind bars, and black threatens bishop b4 check, winning it back. After a long thought, he could find nothing better than castling. There is nothing better. And then, by the seesaw device of perpetually attacking the white queen, the game was agreed drawn. One of the most extraordinary games in chess literature. This is Grandmaster Damien Lemos here for OnlineChessLessons.net. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. 
If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending and growth hacks to improving your chess without um, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.